please join me in welcoming Dr. Alice Agagino. Thanks, Joanne. Can you hear me without the microphone? <laughs> no? You Okay, this one is broadcasting enough. Great. Okay. I just wanted to point out that I do run an AI lab called the Berkeley Expert Systems Technology Lab, which is what I started with when I was at Berkeley. And as we started doing more energy and sustainability research, we had to come up with another name. So we came up with the Berkeley Energy and Sustainable Technology Lab. But either way, it's the best lab. <laughs> as opposed to my colleague down the hall that has the bad lab, the Berkeley Automated Design Lab. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about greening the Internet of Things, smart products in a smart grid, and really raise some questions about, you know, are we really helping the environment with the smart grid and smart products on it, or are we going to make it worse? And so I hope you're going to help me out um, in coming up with good ideas here. I thought I would start with just at least my perspective on what the smart grid is because, you know, depending on your viewpoint, you'll have a different definition of what that's all about. What is the Internet of Things? Um, what is good sustainable design? And I'd like to hear from you what you think good design is. And then how do we make it green? Uh, I'll give you an example of some of the research that I've done, uh, some of the behind the scenes technology about it, and then what's next? So it all begins um, with a smart grid in the 2003 blackout. How many of you went through that? So was it really like this in New York City with no lights and, and in the sunset? It's just hard to imagine um, New York City being like this. And when there was a review of the 2003 blackout, there was an analysis of what went wrong. And part of it was the decision making, part of it was lack of information at the right point in the right time at different utilities. And so the smart grid was motivated with the idea of let's make it more reliable, let's make the utilities um, more secure so that this won't happen again. And then with the energy crisis, um, 2007, the Energy Independence and Security Act, the concept broadened. And in the last couple of weeks, you probably heard Congress talking about those incandescent bulbs and all the politics associated with incandescent bulbs. Well, that was part of this act. What it added was not um, saying what you should do with incandescent bulbs, but the idea that uh, there should be standards on energy of bulbs. And it turns out that, in fact, incandescent bulbs with the current technology just won't meet those standards. So there's a lot of controversy. Uh, uh, about that um, and a, a bill that was trying to override that aspect of it. But currently the bill stands so that there will be no, um, most incandescent bulbs would not meet the standards by 2012 January. But there are a whole bunch of things that were added to this bill as well. It started broadening this concept of what the smart grid is to look at more you folks. What happens in the home? What happens at work? More of a, a customer-focused interpretation of the smart grid. How do you use um, be behavior change or motivate behavior change so that you can balance the load on the systems and not make it entirely a kind of a techie network kind of system? It also added energy conservation in federal buildings and certain standards they have to meet. They have to use energy saving appliances. Retrofits have to meet certain standards. In fact, be carbon neutral by a certain year as well. So this is a, an a, um, image of a simplistic image from the EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, of what the, the, u, the utilities were like before the smart grid. I mean, basically, a power plant would generate electricity. It would go through various transmission lines where, in order to reduce the uh, losses, uh, transmission losses might increase the, the voltage, and then it has to reduce the voltage at substations and then at your house. But the flow is one way. The energy goes from the utility to your house. There's very little information flow either way and just kind of really simplistic interactions. This is uh, EPRI's image of what the smart grid might look like. You've got two-way flow. 
So there's more of an emphasis that locally at businesses or in your home, you might have solar power, you might have wind power. So now you have the ability for customers to actually be generators and add their energy to the grid. You also have information flows with meters that uh, in between customers could could actually communicate between customers and utilities, between business and the utilities, between business and customers from the home. So different ways that the energy can flow and the information can flow in, in this vision of the smart grid. But it's a complicated system, and depending on who you're talking to or what company somebody works with, they might have a different perspective. So for instance, some people, when they think of the smart grid, they think of all that data what's happening with all the information in the system. And so that, from that viewpoint, you, you may have, does anybody have a smart sensor at your home? So there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of controversy about the smart sensors and there are good ways and bad ways to try to sm sell the smart sensors. But the idea is that um, you would have better information about how much energy you're actually using on a minute-by-minute -minute basis in your home. And the utilities could also better understand what the load demand is. And that information could be given to you in a form that you might be able to optimize and lower costs. Um, smart devices are things that you would put now on the smart grid. So right now your computers are on the grid. They're generating energy. Uh, they're using energy as well. Printers, appliances, thermal systems, lights are interesting, and that's something I'm going to I'm going to talk a, a bit more about. Security systems could be put on the smart grid. Um, health monitoring systems, entertainment systems, and so on. So it's now hard to distinguish your internet from the smart grid from some local networks. And the idea is they may eventually talk to each other. Another view of that information is what's happening with all the energy generation. And uh, that expansion of the act added wind, solar, and micro hydro and geothermal. And by geothermal, I mean geothermal wells in the ground that would take advantage of temperature differential in the wells. And so this view is just a whole lot of data that has to be uh, validated, processed, corrected, and analyzed. And then there's no point in getting data unless you make better decisions with it. So there has to be better decision making, both from the utility and the customer standpoint. And you have to decide what your data rates are. How quickly do you want the data? What's important really to make those kinds of decisions? So another view of the smart grid is what's happening in the energy and how do you use it to balance loads? And that has to do with how do you store the energy in the system? Because it, the smart grid is actually going to reduce energy demand. It can only do it if we as customers change our behavior so we are not putting everything on the grid at the same time at peak loads, or if we can generate electricity and add it to the, to the grid. But the ways that we generate electricity aren't necessarily matched when we use it. So for instance, you can't get solar power at night. And so I'll give you some examples of why being able to store energy in one way or, or another is important. So some people that think about the smart grid or work on the smart grid are really interested in how to heavy uh, balance the loads so that we don't have to build more power plants. I mean, that's the ultimate benefit to society, reduce energy and reduce all the carbon and greenhouse gases that are generated by building new power plants. So if we can meet our demand in energy in a way that allows us to not build new power plants, then we save, it's good for the environment, it's, it's good for energy. As we decommission the uh, coal power plants, what are we going to replace them with is, is another question as well. So just as an example, and, and uh, I've lived most of my life in the West. I, I was uh, born in New Mexico and then lived for the most part in California. And so those images, my uncle lives in New York City, so seeing those images of New York in the dark was quite amazing to me. But in the last couple weeks, you've had a heat wave, right? Today is beautiful, right? other than the rain. It was pretty nice weather today, wasn't it? it no? Oh, well. I just flew in, actually. I flew in an hour ago. <laughs> But it wasn't a heat wave, right? OK, so two weeks ago, there was, was a heat wave. And I don't know if these initials mean things to you. or the, These are utilities and energy. Pardon? ISO New England. But what does the ISO stand for? 
but it's a utility energy broker, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is some data during this period. It was a couple weeks ago. And it shows um, that you were at an all-time peak, actually. Most, a lot of the Midwest and the Northeast was at an uh, all-time peak. I know where PJM is. Does anybody know where that is? Pacific. No. no. Pennsylvania. Pen Pennsylvania, because I know it's the Northeast. OK. And so they were at a previous all-time peak. And uh, is that the Midwest? Is that the MSO is the Midwest? But on the eastern seaboard and in the Midwest, you were at an all-time peak in many areas. And here's another way to look at it. What did that mean in terms of the cost of energy? And so the cost of a megawatt hour is often, you know, at, at, at non-peak times, close to $50 per megawatt hour. At the peak time during that period, it was at 350 so the cost of energy at the peak was seven times the cost of energy at the low load time. Now, you normally don't see that. You pay the same price for energy. But your utilities have to pay that peak load. And even at the peak load, if we took the peak load here, that was 100, and the peak load at 350, it was 3.5 times the price. And so what these utilities and en energy brokers do is they get the weather, they get the estimates of what's going to happen, and they calculate what the cost of energy is going to be the day ahead power price. And so they've already negotiated what they think they're going to be paying at those peak loads. And so the question is, if you actually had to pay that differential, if you had to pay seven times more for energy or four times more per energy during a peak load, do you think you would change your behavior? Yes. <laughs> so that overall, maybe the cost to you would, in fact, be lower than what you're paying now. And I think one of the, the concerns about the smart meters is people are worried that it will raise the cost to them. So this is cooling us off, isn't it? Or just making it more human? I don't know. So what are some of the things you might do if you are paying seven times more, or three times more, or four times more? Turn you turn something off. You know, so instead of cooking your special four-hour spaghetti sauce during the day, you know, when the air conditioning is on, maybe you'd have a salad for dinner or you'd eat dinner late at night or you'd wash your clothes at night rather than doing it at the peak load. But right now, other than just hearing maybe news stories, you may not know, you know, when is the peak coming, uh, what is the load on the system in my region versus somewhere else. And so that's the motivation here is to balance the peak load and try to prevent, in order, in order to meet the peak, you know, we're okay at meeting the average, but in order to meet the peak, we don't want to have to build new power plants. Here's a, another, another interesting view. I, uh, part of my research is with a center called Citrus, the Center for Information <laughs> Technology and the Interest of Society. And we have memberships from different companies that are involved in IT and information technology issues and, and the smart grid. But we also have a country, Denmark. Denmark is one of our partners. And so they contribute, and, and we just recently worked on a joint workshop on the smart grid with Denmark and Citrus. And this, I just thought this was interesting. You don't have to read the details here. But what this is is a plot of where they are now in terms of the percentage of their demand. The red is their demand. <laughs> And the blue is how much energy they're generating by wind power to today. So 20% of their energy comes from wind power today. And their goal is by the year 2025, 50% of their energy will be from wind power. Well, if you look at demand day and night, you know, you've got peaks and lows because you're not using it much at night. Uh, wind happens both day and night. So unlike solar, you know, there's a lot of variation um, over, over the day for wind power, but it does have its peaks and lows. So right now it's only providing wind in Denmark is only providing a percentage of the overall demand. But now in the year 2025, if they are successful, then they're going to have times where they're actually just by wind alone generating more power than they need to meet demand. And so to motivate the idea of storage, how do you store that ac ex excess energy? The same thing with solar. How do you store, if you're living in New Mexico where, our, where I grew up, how do you store the energy during the day so you can use it later on? 
And so that raises the question of how do we store energy in a way that's good for the environment? So that's some people's view of the smart grid, and that's a lot of work. And so you don't think about it, but all the hydroelectric is really stored energy. It's a battery, if you will, for energy. It's using gravity to store energy in those dams. And they can release the dams, they can generate energy when they need or when they have a peak, and there's a little lead time and, and all of that. But most of the world's stored energy, actually, um, if you think of it sort of as a big battery, water battery, is in the dams. Next is, is uh, compressed air. And batteries, you know, traditional batteries, are actually a small part of the stored energy today involved in any kind of grid or anything else. And the problem with batteries is they aren't necessarily good for the environment. Um, you may have seen, has, did anybody see the movie, What Killed the Electric Car? Yeah. yeah, so what does the movie say, Kill the Electric Car? General Motors. General Motors. Yeah, do you believe that? <laughs> you know, of course it's controversial, and, and the U.S. automotive companies were resisting change, but that's really, in my mind, not what killed the electric car. What killed the electric car is when California increased the demand for electric cars, and so there were a lot of experiments between um, the three Detroit companies and California. Uh, they were using lead-acid batteries. And when they did an environmental analysis, a full life cycle analysis, it turns out when you mine the rare earth materials to make a battery, when you process it, when you use it, when you get rid of it, there's a lot of toxins that are released. And so when they looked at all those toxins being released with the traditional lead acid battery, it was actually worse for the environment than if you were just burning um, you know, a carbon-based fuel. And that was the real reason in California that they changed the standards and got rid of the electric car. But the good news is there's new research on batteries and lithium ion batteries and other batteries that are, that are more efficient, but that really does also motivate other sort of storage technologies, and some of it you can do in your own home. So you're not going to do a flywheel in your own home, but it's great for wind power or something else. You might be able to, to, to use the mass of a wind power. But ice and buildings are really kind of an interesting thing to think about in storing energy. I mean, 100 or 200 years ago, we used ice, right? And actually, ice was used to cool a house. So it is possible that perhaps you could have a, a, a bottom shelf of your refrigerator that's ice, that turns to ice sheltered from the rest of the refrigerator to be used to store it in the evening and then can be used to cool it during the day or to cool the house. Buildings are really interesting because there's a lot of cool air or hot air that could be stored in buildings or parts of buildings when they aren't being used. Um, some people have talked about hot tubs being, you know, at night or when you're not using the hot tub, you could actually be storing energy in the hot tub. So, so it'll be interesting to see how other kind of thermal non-electric systems could be used as batteries as well. One moment. Yeah. Well, have you ever used a pneumatic pump? Yeah, it seems larger than I expected. Yeah, so, yeah, particularly in industrial sites, there's a lot of use of that in a larger system. So now, with electric cars and the new generation of electric cars, many of us, I'm on the list, by the way, I'm on the list to get one. Um, now the new electric cars have better batteries. By the way, with the old lead-acid lead -acid batteries, they only lasted a year. So they made the car heavier, they made it less, you know, efficient in terms of dragging all that mass around, and you had to recycle them or get rid of them in one year. That's what was so bad. The new batteries last longer, they appear to be less toxic, and now they become a battery that people use and take with them. So how, how could we use that? Is it going to be a problem or a solution? Yeah? What about the Prius battery? Yeah, the Prius has a battery. It's a smaller battery than they would have in an electric car plug-in, the new plug-in Priuses, but you, you don't normally plug in the current Priuses. So the notion coming is plug-in hybrids or electric vehicles. And now you have batteries that you could charge from the grid or from some other source to balance things out. 
Now, if everybody charged their electric car or their plug-in hybrid at the same time, then that just makes the situation worse. And so the utilities are really worried about, you know, charging all at this, the same time. You get home from, from work, you know, you've been commuting, you get home from work, and you plug in just, you know, at, at the peak time. On the other hand, they could be used to store energy in your own house if you could charge them at non-peak hours, which most people actually would do. You know, you just program it easily so it's charging from midnight to 6 a.m. or something like that, not at, at peak times. And so you might be able to use it as a local energy storage in your own home as well. So I, I don't know, none of you have smart meters because you don't want them or they haven't been offered to you? Not offered here on the Cape. Not offered on the Cape, okay. So, yeah? I built my house. And where, where was this? That was in Framingham. Yeah, there, there, were, there were some pockets of places that were doing that. A lot of it started with the 1970s, the first oil crisis. And then as a, as a country, we lost interest, actually, in energy until the, the next Gulf War and the next oil crisis. Denmark, by the way, continued. From, from the early 1970s, they just continued to build up their renewable energy and their smart grid. Well, PG&E started smart meters in, in California, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, and did a terrible job at advertising, a terrible job of working with customers. And so people were offered the choice and refused them. You know, they were going to be given smart meters. There was actually a campaign where they had no smart meters, you know, with a cross through it. And, and, and whenever anybody would ask, you know, how are you going to use the smart meters, they gave them, a, you know, just a, a terrible uninformative response. And so this is part of the work that I do. I'm really interested in the human-centered aspect of design and technology and looking at how the technology can en enhance the quality of our life and help the planet. And so pg and &E has tried to now rethink why they have the smart meters and why and how they communicate with the public with the idea that ultimately we all share the goal of saving energy. I mean, nobody is proud, I don't think, of all the energy they're using. You want to increase the quality of life. You want to be convenient. You want to be safe, because there's a security issue, positive and negative, and peace of mind, which might have to do with things like monitoring your health or monitoring the health of, of someone that you care about. And I don't know if it's worthwhile to show this or not, or whether I can even do it. But here's an example of how now they have changed their campaign. And maybe. Well, I'll address that. Let's see if this comes through. I do not specialize in the security issue, and so I'm not going to actually cover the security issue, but it is a really critical issue that that be part of the solution of this system. Who said that? Who is the big brother? <laughs> yes, big brother. You'd be surprised what big brother can do now, too, that we're not resisting with our smartphones and everything else. But, but that is absolutely critical to the system. So uh, let's see if this one works or whether you can hear it or not. And maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah, don't. Let's not worry about it. I'm Anya from Bakersfield, and this is my power. When I was growing up, I used to leave the lights on, the radio on, everything. I don't want my kids to do that. With the smart meter program, we were able to see what you used this last is the best year you'll compared get. to this year or last week compared to this week. It's a good tool that I can show my kids. A couple weeks ago, I left the light on, and they go, Mommy, you left the light on. I'm very proud of them. Learn more about smart meter and pricing plan options like smart rate at pge.com slash smart meter. Okay. <laughs> what are the differences of the columns in that smart meter? Oh, that, that was just a graphical display. I wouldn't put too much in, in, um, in the actual display that they use here. But that's an excellent question because how you display information is critical to how you respond. 
And so there are user studies that show people just want a simple switch. You know, you know it's, we don't want to go back to the old days of the, the Japanese VCRs that nobody could you know, program and the lights were blinking all the time. So how to design them so that they really work and so that you have the information when you need it and when you make good decisions is critical. Okay, so we have the potential now with everything being metered, with the information flows um, going in many different directions to have smart homes, smart offices, and smart cities. And so um, Zigbee, by the way, did this graph. They're a company that does standards for these kinds of networks. Being able to instrument your lights, your heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, you know, your toaster, your refrigerator, your entertainment system, healthcare, tele-assistance, so you can monitor health or health of, of a loved one, monitoring security, you know, a smart door or something, smart windows, temperature and gas, et cetera. And then um, in your office space, connecting on the internet what you're doing in your car, so your car could communicate. Um, and then the digital city in terms of, you know, is there a parking space in this garage I'm going to so that, you know, or do I need to drive around and go somewhere else? Environmental monitoring is, uh, you know, are there greenhouse gases? Is there a concern about CO2 in the building I'm in? And maybe we should put some more plants in it. And, and these kinds of, of issues. I, I talk about the, the car because at, at Berkeley we do have a project called the, the uh, Millennium Car Project in which everybody who's agreed to sign up for this program transmits where they're at and then it gets stored and used, is used instantly to tell about traffic jams. You know, so it's, anom an, it's anonymous, so you don't know where you are as an individual, but it gets displayed so that when you're in the car, you know where somebody is stuck and, and then they can analyze uh, traffic patterns. So that brings me to the fact that now with this vision, everything is on the internet or the internet of things. And in fact, this is a, a little infograph developed by Cisco Systems. It's estimated that in 2008, the number of things, non-human things connected on the internet exceeded the number of people on earth. Now, is this good or bad? And I have, I have some number here that um, they also estimate, let's see what that number is, that in five or ten years, how many people there in the world? It just turned seven billion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. turned seven billion. They estimate that within five to ten years, a hundred billion devices will be connected on the smart grid. A hundred billion devices. Now, is this good or bad? Very bad. Yeah, how, <laughs> how can having a hundred and billion devices of electronics be good for the planet. Yeah, no, um, yeah. It's very good, nothing will work in It's very good because of what? Because nothing will work in Nothing will <laughs> You don't think if we could all plug in everything, we can optimize everything? I mean, that's, you know, that's supposedly the vision in all of this. Okay, even the cows are getting plugged in. This is a true story of a company in Holland that uh, puts sensors on the ears of their dairy cows or their cows. And if the cow, they can tell if the cow's pregnant, they can tell if the cow's sick, they can tell, you know, if it's got an elevated fever, or they can tell if it's wandering outside its region, and then the farmer can go help the cow. And there is a huge amount of data in this, in this Dutch startup, by the way, it's called Sparked. Um, they generate, the cows generate 200 megabytes of data per year. Do any of you use, <laughs> some of you may have health monitoring systems, right? Do any of you use that Fitbit, you know, see how many calories you're burning up? No, no, nobody's out there jogging, okay. <laughs> One of, my, one of my graduate students is trying to lose weight, and so he's got this Fitbit somewhere on his body. And what it does is it wirelessly sends information to a cell phone or something else, and then you can go to a website and display it. And your comment with the big brother is that, you know, they've done some data mining, and it turns out you can tell exactly what somebody's doing if you see their Fitbit. 
what kind of physical activity they're engaged in. There is a pattern. So, you know, security is, is, is a big issue here. So, my concern is how do we make this Internet of Things on the smart grid so that it actually is good for the environment? And what I'm going to do is just go through, you know, I could give you, you've seen it a zillion times, you know, the graphs of how much carbon is out there and, you know, greenhouse gases and energy use that's gone exponential. It's late at night, you don't want to see a bunch of graphs, so I'm just going to show you some artistic views of the actual stuff that we have out there. <laughs> this is today without the smart grid. No, this is just what we have now. This is the stuff we're throwing out. We're recycling it. Maybe, yeah. I'll address that. So here's a, a graph of a, a colleague of mine, Mark Martin. He did a study of electronics in the, in the Bay Area, and the study was product lifetime and how long products last and then how often new products are put on the market. And basically all this is saying is products are lasting less time and we're getting more and more of them. And that's why they're piling up. You've got to have, you gotta have your, you know, your iPhone 4. The iPhone 3 isn't good anymore. You gotta, you know, you've got to buy the latest feature in something new. And, and thus these electronics build up. And so we talked about, I heard someone talk about recycling. So that gets to this issue of how do you make products green? What is a good product and a good green product? And I always try to emphasize that you have to look over the entire life cycle. So like the example of the electric cars or the lead acid battery, you have to look at what happens throughout the entire life cycle of it. But now that we're, we're going to say we're going to look at the whole life cycle, what makes a good product? I mean, you know a good product when you see it, right? You, you buy one and then you throw it out. That was a bad product, yeah? It meets the customer's need. It meets the customer's need. I would say one thing just before that, yeah? When I grew up, it was something that lasts. Something that lasts. It gets used, okay? There are so many things out there that you buy and you throw out and they go to landfill or something else. So it gets used. It meets the customer need. It has some kind of function associated with it that increases the quality of your life. I will add, yes, yes. It's repairable. It's repairable. That's, that's part of it. And that's also part of it sustainable. Um, it typically doesn't stand alone. So I would argue the good products need a system to be able to repair it. You know, a cell phone is no good unless you have other people who have cell phones and so on. And this last part is really important as well. Because usually we don't buy things, we don't do things because we need it for survival. We do it because it's meaningful for us. But that's highly culturally determined. And as a part of the National Academy, I, was in, I, I got an email message saying, Mattel Toys, for instance, has, has decided that they are going to have crowdsource their next uh, career for Barbie. Okay, and so they were going to have the whole world vote on the next career for Barbie, and there were there were four op there were four options. One was she could be a computer engineer, she could be I think an architect, she could be a doctor, she could be a newscaster, and I was part of this group of people that had a kind of viral campaign to vote for the computer engineer Barbie. <laughs> we, we thought it was about time. And it turns out that the adults won on the computer engineer Barbie, but the children voted for the newscaster. And Mattel decided that they were going to do both. And so, but they had to get the Barbie design by the time of the big toy show in New York City. And so they asked the head of the Society of Women Engineers, the National Academy was asked, I was involved with some of this, how would you design? the next generation, you know, of, of Barbie with a computer engineer. I won't go through the details if you want. I can show you the, the pictures of it. It was much different than they originally envisioned. She should, of course, be 
fashionable and have a small computer and communication was, was important. But I bring this up because that's an art culture. But I've done some work in the Middle East on the Faluda. Does any, have anybody seen the Faluda? Which is basically a Barbie for Islamic countries. And it was created, I believe, in Lebanon. And so it is a much different cultural concept um, of what a Barbie would, an adult doll would look like um, in different cultures. So I think in most of the things we do, culture, culture is important. But I also bring up it's important if you're going to change behavior. Did you have a burqa? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a burqa. It was um, a baya, and a baya and a, and a hijab. But it came off. Yeah. <laughs> she, had, she had very fashionable clothes underneath. Um, but this, here's another example of a project I'm working on. I'm working with a Native American community about two hours north of San Francisco in a, in a city called Ukiah, the Pinoleville Pinole Pomo Nation. And, and like a lot of Native Americans, they're very distrustful of non-Native Americans. And, uh, but they knew that the low-income housing that they were in, which was like formaldehyde trailers, didn't have good insulation. They were paying a lot for propane. They had nothing to do with their cultural heritage. And they really did believe they wanted to do something uh, that would be good for the environment. And so they came to Berkeley and were looking for people that might work with them. And I have a technique that I call an innovation workshop, which I work with underserved communities so that they don't need us to tell them what to do, but so that they can design the world that they want. They're the expert on their needs. They know what they want, and so we have a, a co-design kind of strategy. So we worked with them, and I actually made it as an exercise in my freshman design class. And uh, we held a one-day innovation workshop, came up with uh, some, just some concepts of culturally sensitive, sustainable buildings that were just so much different than what they were living in, but were totally new concepts. They were somewhat inspired by the Mongolian yurts, but they recognized that eating food and sitting around with a community and extended family was the most important thing in the house. They would have what they called big time. They would often have uh, the dances. And so being able to be in a circle around a, the equivalent of a campfire, but around the cooking area was critical to their housing needs. But the young people, and by the way, we split them up into different age groups so everyone had a voice, because too often young people are afraid to, to speak up with their elders in some of these communities and so on. Some of them wanted privacy at well. So, so they had um, a house design that had kind of roundness in the center, but privacy on the outside. And there was different types of renewable energy. And uh, working with the Pinoleville Pomo Nation, they redesigned the house so it, it could be produced at the cost they wanted. There are a lot of issues. Should it be adobe or straw bale? And uh, we came up working with them with a cost-effective design. We helped them win a Department of Energy grant. And they actually got enough money to build this house for uh, three or four demonstration homes. And they broke ground on this uh, uh, sometime this summer, a couple of months ago. But an important part of this as a whole system was they were looking at renewable energy that they wanted to add to the home. They used materials that they thought were important. And they also recognized that they have 95% unemployment and that whatever was part of this design, they needed to train their own people in green technologies to maintain it and maybe have you know, a source of, of income. Now, the reason I bring this up is cultural sensitivity is I remember reading that Native Americans in this area were objecting to wind turbines, right? There were some... Where does that stand? Where, where does that... Where does that stand? There's a suit. I mean, this is a problem, right? You know, so there were like two sides fighting each other over this. Whereas in this nation... In this nation, they care about the environment. They care about birds of prey. Um, they care about the salmon coming back, so they, but they were still willing to consider the microturbines. But the difference was that they designed it. They were trained on the wind monitoring, on the, collecting the solar insulation data, collecting the, the, the energy that was in the river that they owned, and so on. And they were involved in the process and made their own tribal decisions about what they wanted. And they also discovered, they're trying to relearn their own Poma language, they also discovered that they had one spot on their reservation was called the wind hole. 
in their old Pomo language. And so, you know, there had been a history of some kind of interaction or respect for the wind. And so this uh, little girl here was part of, uh, we, we, would held, we held workshops on renewable energy and how they work. So a girl built her own little wind turbine. And, and so that's part of the cultural sensitivity in the process. And what communities want to achieve in terms of sustainability might very well depend on the location and, and their cultural background. So I mentioned, uh, someone mentioned recycling back there. Um, when we look at the life cycle, we really do need to look at, you know, things like the extraction, the materials processing, the manufacturing, the transportation at all levels, in addition to the use level. Because a lot of times when we think about um, how we're using products, we think about how we're using them today as opposed to where they got to where they were at or where they go, whether we recycle, we dispose of them, we reuse them again and put them back in the cycle. At each of these stages, we're taking stuff out, materials, energy, fresh water, and we're putting things out in terms of toxins and potential pollutions, uh, solid pollutions, airborne or water pollution. And we think, you know, when we're recycling, we're doing a good thing. I, I will argue that if you compost in your own garden at home, that's always a good thing. I can't imagine that's not a good thing. But once we start sending things out with lots of transportation and a lot of processing, then it becomes unclear. And the problem is that in a lot of companies, they don't know what happens or where and how some of their subproducts come from. And so they're dealing with contractors of subcontractors of subcontractors, and they don't know what went on environmentally in all of those steps in the operation. So it's, it's pretty complex. I saw a study of uh, automotive companies in the U.S., and then they only have a handle on 20 to 40 percent of their contracts and subcontracts. And a good 60 to 80 percent, they really don't know where the raw material and the, and the sources come from. And it may vary monthly or daily depending on where the resources are. So in recycling, you know, when you recycle, do you know what happens to the stuff you're recycling? Do you, and in particular, you probably know where some of the stuff goes that's local, but with electronic recycling, do you know what happens to it? Yeah? And so all those piles you saw in those other photos were piles that were associated with those sort of efforts. So you don't know if you're really doing a good social thing in recycling. You don't know with all the transportation what's actually going on. So it's, it's quite complex. There was a group at MIT that put sensors on some electronic uh, parts and then traced what happened to them. And it wasn't even a straight shot to China. You know, I mean, it would get separated in one place and, you know, and then it would have a certain other type of separation in another place. So it actually isn't clear. We need to develop better ways of tracing what happens with the electronic parts. There actually is some hope if they have, you know, some information in them that we can do that. Yeah? There seems to be a hiatus between um, the need for disposing of um, motherboards or other things that are no longer in use or your printer from two years and actually having a society which has organized itself so everybody in the society knows where to take those things in order to get rid of them. Because what happens is they pile up in your house and you've got more and more of them. <laughs> that's <laughs> true. <laughs> well, that's, it's part of a system. A good design includes how you can recycle it and reuse it in a way that you feel good about is part of what needs to go into the design of the system. And can you reuse it and do they last so longer? The Absolutely. Absolutely. That's true. Absolutely. And and that's where you have the leverage if you can get the two working together. I got one here and one there. Have you read Paul Hawkins? Hawkins oh yeah. The e factor and how in Germany they're doing that where everyone the the manufacturers are responsible for the end use of the product. Yeah, there's some really good examples of that. Um, it, like anything 
that involves trying to change the policy and get the law of reverse results that happens too. So you, you have to monitor it. So for instance, in Germany, they would have a required take back of automobiles and that meant a lot of automobiles ended up in Hungary or places that didn't have those um, laws. The, the other thing that would happen is a certain percentage of mechanical parts had to come from recycled materials. And so companies couldn't get the recycled materials, so they actually sold brand new parts as recycled parts. You know, so you know, there were some, some things to work out in the system, but it certainly is much further along than, than we are, yeah? Right. So the, there are incentives you can put in the system. I was told I should leave some time some, some QA. So what I'll do is I'll show you just one example of, of something I think actually worked, though. And it did take working with uh, government and working with communities. This is just to say uh, the important thing is to do the triple bottom line, where we're considering the societal needs and the user needs. The economic needs, there's nothing wrong with the profit. You, you know, it's no good to have something that's sustainable if it's not economically sustainable in addition to uh, being good for the, the environment. But the, this humble example is the one I love. And my colleague, Art Rosenfeld, put this together. And this was a case where during the first energy crisis, California decided to set some standards associated with appliances. And in this case, this is a study of refrigerators. And the refrigerator manufacturers resisted this, but California was a big enough state and a big enough market that they decided that they would adhere to it. And so this is a case where you didn't, you know, I showed you the triple bottom line. You can meet the need, you can increase quality, you can get energy efficiency, and you can cut costs. Because too often we think, oh, to have a green product, we've got to pay more for it. And I think this is a good example where you did all the right things. So the incentives, working with the government policy, and then with industry, getting public support. In the first energy crisis, they decided that they really had to tackle the big sources of energy, and one of them was refrigerators. So starting in 1947 to about 2000, this red line is the size of refrigerators, and that just continue, goes up. So if you think of a quality in your daily life of a refrigerator size, you know, it's slowly going up. If you look at the energy use per unit, however, that was going up just exponentially. And then when this policy was put into the place, lo and behold, our brilliant engineers that you know, can send people to the moon are able to make efficient refrigerators. And so the cost of energy went way down per unit of refrigerator. And do they, did it cost you a lot more to get this energy efficient refrigerator? No. Here's a plot of the cost in dollars of those refrigerators. So you can have a higher quality product, one that's good for the environment with the right incentives at a lower cost. And you may think, well, refrigerators, you know, how much energy you really save in a refrigerator? What he did was he looked at the amount of energy that was used in 1974 when this policy took effect, and then what happened afterwards, and he, and he carried it out over so many years. And the lighter pink here is the energy saved and then the energy used. And then he showed the equivalent amount of that compared at the time to all the photovoltaic systems in the U.S. at the time, conventional hydro. He compared it to Three Gorges Dam, which is very controversial in China. And you can see that the amount of energy saved is very significant compared to all these energy sources. So it made a huge difference. Well, it's a good. I don't know where they where they are, but I I don't think they lost a whole lot in terms of uh, reliability. Yeah. What was this? A regulation that you couldn't sell uh, refrigerated in California unless it met these. Yeah. Well, California is way ahead of the rest of it. Well. And that, but that there, there was a comment about you have to change, you know, the policy, and this is one actually most of the public supported it, and originally the manufacturers resisted it, but then they bought into it. You know, now they became proud. Uh, General Electric, Echo Imagination, and Westinghouse are one of the, the two leaders now in terms of high energy efficiency and, and the smart grid and so on. So 
maybe kicking and screaming to start out with, but then recognize that it's good for everybody. Um, and there's still a lot more room. There's still a lot more room for improvement on refrigerators. For instance, when you want to get your, your little soda out of the refrigerator, you're opening the door and all the cold air is going out, compartmentalized. Drawer, drawers could be a, a, a good advantage. You could add that ice in the bottom for the, the battery. And then, of course, your grocery stores where you're, you know, you're getting your one can of you know, ice cream or something and you're, you know, you're cooling off the whole store. So there's still a lot more room for improvement. So let me just briefly go over some of the things we did with smart lighting and tell you why I care about smart lighting. And I should have turned this off, sorry. Um, the reason I care about smart lighting is 30% of commercial energy actually goes in, of office buildings, goes into the, to the lighting systems. So it's a big percentage of, of the commercial energy, a little less so for homes. It has a great potential for being able to make a difference because smart lighting control systems can improve energy up to 20 to 60 percent. And it can improve satisfaction. There are all kinds of things where you could get the lighting just the way you want to by personalizing it. Um, but there's a lot of variation among individuals on what lighting you actually prefer. And so there's an opportunity to personalize it for individuals. And there's a lot of money in lighting. $12 billion in the U.S., $40 billion worldwide. So, you know, we've got to improve the economy here in terms of new lighting systems. New York Times building, has anybody been in that? Yes. Okay. What's it like? Um, big and lots of artificial lighting. So they're, not, they're supposed to be using a lot of natural lighting. Um, yeah, but it's such a big building, it doesn't go into the interior. That's true. Well, they have tried to design it so there are actually atriums in it. Regardless, 30% of their energy savings, so they had originally designed the, the building without smart lighting. They went back and got a smart lighting design system, and they're claiming that of the benefits, 30% actually go from the harvesting of the daylighting, 10% uh, from occupancy sensors, 2% for scheduling things properly, 50% for the, the fine tuning at different levels, and that they were saving $300,000 a year. The problem is they invested a lot in designing the building and commissioning the building. And what commissioning of the building means is after it's been installed, you have to work out the bugs and fine tune it. And they've been analyzing and commissioning it for a couple of years. And indeed, this building, unlike a lot of buildings that are LEED certified, is actually operating in the way it was designed. So that's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is it's really hard to do this. If you're retrofitting your office, you've got a big office and there's one switch for all the lights in the building, you can't afford to go back and rewire the whole thing. And so most buildings are really retrofit. And so the retrofitting costs can be very high. Um, the focus usually is on energy and not on the people. There's no accommodation for uh, individual preferences. A lot of the lamps are all wired, to, wired together with one switch, and you can't personalize it. And that got me interested, because I'm very interested in sustainable solutions that increase, increase the quality of life. And I thought, here's a wonderful way to personalize lighting just the way you want it. Do it at minimal cost and retrofitting using wireless devices. Um, make it extensible so that building managers can play around with it if there's a brownout or a, ma a major uh, energy problem. And we did a full life cycle analysis of our system and reduced the environmental, made environmental Im improvements by 17 to 344 times better depending on the factor. So what we did is, what did we do? So that was one of my students walking into a lab, which was a large lab that originally only had one switch about 1,000 square feet and 20 luminaries in the wall. So she walks into the lab. She clicks just one button to get the setting exactly where she wants it. And she can have as many settings as she wants. She can have her desktop setting. She could have her working on the computer setting. She could be working on the lab setting, whatever. One setting. She can do this from her cell phone or her desktop computer as well. And then she goes to her office, and she has the lighting just the way she wants it. And notice now only these two lights are on. The others are off. The one behind her is at a lower level than the light in front of her. No rewiring was required. Yeah? I'm worried about the uh, wireless uh, communication uh, uh, polluting the atmosphere and affecting us. I, I think that's very detrimental. Yeah, that, you know, that, that is an issue with all of the radio waves that we have yes. in, in different buildings. 
Yeah, the, the research doesn't show, though, that these small level radio waves are causing any damage. Big electromagnetic fields might, but actually, they've tried to show this. They show that heating up with a cell phone is a problem, but that's mostly because it, you're, you're uh, cooking. I mean, seriously, I mean, if you've got a, a cell phone on you all the time, you're actually heating things up. Eyes are the most sensitive part yeah. of the body. Yeah. Uh, speaking of electro, uh, I'm an electrical engineer. Okay. I also have radio telephone license. And if any place is going to be trouble, it's the operators in a transmitting place, whether it be TV or radio broadcast. And, uh, they're they're high-energy yeah, waves, high energy or radar Where, whereas the wireless you have in your home, they really it's haven't found. Yeah. Not so what these things look like is something like this, by the way, and it's low-energy radio frequency. So here is before and after. So the gold is the energy use in the lab before we implemented the system. And then the green is what we did afterwards. And so we were able to save 50% of energy. Now, the, the analysis of energy saving or light saving devices is that 50% of them are never used. You install one, it doesn't work for you, and you don't use it. So it violates that rule about a good product gets used. Of those that get used, typically they only operate at you know, half of the energy savings that they actually predicted. So to be able to get 50% energy savings over a period of year, we were very pleased with that. In addition, it was an internal office, and we didn't have a sun, so we had a fake sun. And when we put the fake sun in there, we were able to save 70% of lighting. And we improved user satisfaction, a quote from a happy student. <laughs> and it actually made a difference, because right in front of the computer projector, you wanted to turn off these lights right here, because you didn't want them. We were able to get the lights. So you don't always want more lights, in other words. And so what was happening behind the scenes? Well, we used uh, these sensor remote platforms. There was a little bit of AI there. We looked at sensor validation and fusion. We looked at how we were organizing things. We actually tested people about what their lighting preferences were and found that it went all over the map. And uh, just as an example, uh, occupant with the blue preferred lighting using a computer on this end of the spectrum, whereas occupant one with the green was in the middle and yellow was over here. So that motivated why you'd really want to personalize it for individuals and not have uh, one glove fitting all. We worked with the facility managers in terms of what they were able to do and recognizing the lack of sensitivity actually on lighting. Uh, they felt that they knew now how to be able to control by 10% or 20% if they had to reduce the load. We use these wireless sensor platforms. The goal is ultimately they would be very small. The, the biggest cost or size on these platforms are the batteries. The only wiring we did was be able to tap the electricity on the uh, ballast itself. And it has sensors on it for lighting. It has, could have sensors on other things. And then they self-configure. And they can also actuate. So in this little system, we would um, sense, we would validate, we'd make decisions, we'd actuate, and then we would have the lighting system. And there was kind of a, a feedback cycle on that. And I don't know if anybody's seen these things, but they, they're actually little computers. They have an operating system called Tidy OS. They uh, have the wireless communication. And then they also have breadboards for different sensors that you can put on. We could optimize the lighting for, for different uh, purposes. Uh, other extensions include, these were fluorescent lights. We'd really like to go to the new generation of LED lights and um, look at things like increased worker productivity, environmental impact. I think it'd be fun to work on mood lights. <laughs> And we want to scale up. So now we're going to be working on larger scale systems, add daylighting and window control, heating and cooling. And we're working with NASA Ames on this. They have built a new building they're calling the Sustainability Base in NASA Ames in Mountain View with the idea that they need to build up their capacity on Earth for sustainability that they would ultimately take to space travel as well. And then we're going to be working on a larger system in our, in our new Citrus building. So let me end this with just some thought questions for discussion. What things would you actually put on the smart grid? So we don't want all this stuff on the smart grid. I don't want my vegetables on the smart grid. 
I want to be able to put them in my composter without worrying about having a chip in them. Um, how would each thing be designed differently if it was in the smart grid? So how, you know, what kind of features should it have? And then how would they be designed differently if they were part of different systems, systems of systems? So I just end with those uh, thought questions and Q&A.